Hey, Green Machine friends and fans of fun. We've got our comic reviews, but uh, first, I think it's, I think it's time. I think it's time. It's gotten a little grody, and I've been wearing it for most of the year, and I think it's time to retire my favorite hat. It's a little dirty. Gotta start cleaning it somehow. It's a good hat, though. I might, I might bring it out of retirement, but until then, it's time for the Larflees. Mine! 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 All right. Which, which is a good thing. We need money. And we got a lot of books this week. So come check them out. We also have a ton of trade. So if you want trade this week, man, we finally got some trade to fill our shelves. And we're pretty happy about it. So come enjoy comics and celebrate story with us. And we got the good stuff. We'll put it in your vein. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but, uh... First up this week is Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, and this is the wrap-up, and my god, my god, we didn't just get one Batman, we got two Batman, Batman, we got pretty much everyone from Gotham, we got every iteration of TMNT, save for I think the cartoon was the only missing one it felt like, yeah, there was a lot of different TMNT, um, it was just a really, really great, it had the OG black and white, um, and so, what can I say about the story? It was amazing. It was awesome. Uh, I, I don't think you should jump in on book six, but if you've been reading it, you're probably having a good time with it. Uh, you should maybe come and order the trade if you're thinking of getting into it. It was great. The art was good. I, I have a sneaky suspicion. Oh, it's Tinny in the fourth. No wonder. Um, but I have a sneaky suspicion that, um, I, I don't know, some of the artists, because we know Eastman worked on part of it. But some of the artists, I feel like, are the same as the He-Man Masters, or the He-Man uh, Shazam crossover. It was a great crossover. It was great. Yeah. Um, so this was a really, really good showing. Uh, this is out of IDW. Thank you, for, and DC. Thank you for this. Uh, this was a, a heck of a crossover. Uh, next, we're going to do Dungeons & Dragons Darkened Wish. And it pains me to say this, as someone who likes D&D, but it honestly feels to me like the weakest fantasy we have on our shelves right now is kind of this D and D story. It's weird. It's, it's. I I want to like it. It's got all the characters of a party, but this party does not have a lot of synergy. I guess you could say. Uh, one of the main characters keeps getting completely injured. It's it's like every issue starts off with her injured, and then she gets healed, and then she gets injured again. I I don't know. I'm not having the best time with it, but you know we'll wait and see. It's still. It's only three issues deep. There's a few more issues to go. But uh, A Darkened Wish has not really sold me. It's not as good as uh, the Baldur's Gate stuff, I guess you could say. But it's okay. Um, if you do want to jump in on some fantasy or you are a D&D super fan, it is here. And we have more than a few issues, so come pick it up. Oh, best of all, you get the, uh, the nice character sheet on the back, which I do like. I do like the character sheet on the back. Uh, next is God... Whew, we need a second to breathe before I go over this one because my god, my god, Immortal Hulk is amazing. And I know I've gushed about this the whole way through, but there is so much to unpack in this issue. I mean, we know we had uh, Joe Fix It in human form. Uh, he reappears, he, he does some self sacrifice stuff in this. Uh, we've been doing with uh, General Fortian, I think is his name. I think his name is like uh, Ralph Fortian, I think it is. But um, so we've been dealing with that gener general who pretty much combined a bomb and abomination and then took that mutation and combined it with himself. Well, he's kind of going to learn the hard way in this issue what that really entails, what that curse means. The, the curse that's been outlined through Immortal Hulk time and time again. Um, we have just a lot of stuff in place. Uh, honestly, the Devil Hulk is probably my favorite iteration of Hulk. He's so messed up, and on top of that, he's really, really wicked smart. Way smarter than most of the other iterations of Hulk, save for, I think, like, Fix-It and Brown Hulk, who are actually in another issue uh, later on in this uh, storyline. But he's he's such a smart Hulk. He, he plans, he plots, and he's very sinister and dark. All of that is here. Everything about this issue is amazing. It is wrapping up all the stuff with uh, the General Forty and stuff. I had the best time with it. I, I have loved this run. I mean, this is 24 issues deep, and I'm seriously considering buying 
all of the trades for this run because it's that good. Uh, again, you get this amazing art. You, you uh, I mean, you. You have Alex Ross on the cover, and then it's Bennett, Jose, and Mounts. It's so good. I think it's Alex Ross. It looks like he's, he's done it all like of the... Alex Ross. It looks, I'm pretty sure it's Alex Ross on the cover, but I could be mistaken. It could be his protege. Um, anyways, come pick this up, please. It's so good, and we have plenty. It's Alex Ross. Yep, it is Alex Ross. It, does, it looks like an Alex Ross. I should have called it. Um, next is Swordmaster. This is by writer uh, Shuzu. Uh, artist Gunji and adaptation is Greg Pack. Well, there's a lot to unpack with this issue. We find out uh, at the beginning of this issue and actually the end of last issue um, that the Swordmaster is not the only, I guess, not the only master. There are two different other ones. I can't remember what it's called, but the the uh, the the bracelets to add weight to your punch, like they're they're one of the masters. And then there's like one that. I think is a whip master, which uh, I, I don't know. That's kind of a weird weapon. But anyway, so it, it turns out there are other masters. He has to contend with a couple of them. He has to come to uh, decide what he's doing. One of them uh, actually questions his his sanity and, and sort of puts him down as being chosen to be a sword master, which is that, that's kind of a jerk move. But you know, new hero, you got to take your lumps to build your way up. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm fully on board with this. Plus, there's a Shang, Shang-Chi story at the end of this that uh, I, I, I found kind of amusing. It was pretty fun. Uh, it involved uh, Madripoor. I guess the gods of Madripoor at the end. It was pretty cool. Um, but anyways, issue four, Swordmaster, it's a great story. You, but plus, what you get is you get two different art styles in this. You get a very manga-inspired art style for the first story, and then the second story is always done in, like, traditional comic style. And it's really, really fun to see that mashup. I love these books. Uh, this in What's the other one, Arrow? Arrow yeah. We haven't seen Wave yet, have we? Or is no, Wave the one? Wave is in Arrow right now. No. We, I thought Wave was coming. Mm. Anyway, so for issue four, Swordmaster, a great book. Go pick this up. Next is something I didn't think I would enjoy as much as I did, and that is the uh, WWE SmackDown 20th anniversary. Um, I, I honestly, I haven't followed wrestling since like the early 90s, late 80s type stuff. I, my, my, my fandom was like Andre the Giant, Ultimate Warrior, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, who is currently in the hospital, I think. So I, I hope he gets better. But this is uh, WWE SmackDown. I knew very little of these characters. I think I knew Triple H and like one other character. Uh, so I didn't know these characters. But it was fun to see. It was pretty entertaining. It was, it was comical at times. You can tell the politics of the different groups of wrestling being brought together for SmackDown. Um, the, the main character, I was informed, is a two-time winner. Uh, I can't remember what her name is. Uh, two time, two belt, two belt something. Two belt Becky, I think. Becky two belts. Becky two belts. And uh, so I, I, I had a really good time with this book. I read it. I wanted to know more. This is uh, Panada, Good, Acuna, and Chavez. And this is WWE SmackDown. If you like wrestling or you feel like you've had a good time with wrestling as a kid, you might have a pretty good time with this. I, I honestly did. The art was great too. I, I'm actually really impressed with the art. I didn't. I didn't think I would dig it as much as I did, and I, I really had a good time with it. So uh, that'll be on our shelves. Come pick it up. Next is a free book that will be given away in our store, and this is the Joe Hill Presents Hill House Comics. Now, Joe Hill, if you don't know, uh, Stephen King's son who wrote Lock and Key, um, which is a great story that uh, flies off our shelf when we stock it. Um, and this centers around three of his comics that are coming, which are Basket Full of Heads by, by Joe Hill and Leo Max, Dollhouse, which is uh, Mike Carey, Peter Gross, and uh, Jessica Dalva. And then uh, The Low Low Woods, which is uh, uh, Carmen Maria Mercado, Danny. Danny is the artist, just Danny, D-N-A-I. Uh, okay. Uh, and then covers by Sam Wolf and John Cooper. And I also didn't give Reiko uh, Murakami credit for coverage for Basketball of Heads. But anyways, so it's a preview of each one of those stories. I really like them. I think the Dollhouse story in the middle was probably the most creepy one. Uh, I, 
I it was unsettling to the point of disturbing. The first story was just sort of meh, it was kind of like meh, it's okay. And the third story I think deals with lycanthropy, but you never can tell. It, when when dealing with Stephen King or or any of his I, I guess family, uh, they tend to go off in different directions. So what seems like something might turn out to be something else. Uh, they're kind of masters for that sort of stuff. So it was great. I I had a good time with it. Now keep in mind. I'm a little perturbed at Hill House Comics because to, the way we got Hill House Comics was they had to, to kill Vertigo to do it. And I'm not happy about that. I don't necessarily think that Joe Hill caused that, but uh, I, I did have a good time for this Black Label horror comic. I thought it was a, it was a good showing for horror. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a slow burn, clearly. You're not going to get a lot of like super over-the-top stuff with this just yet, but it's leading into these books. So come pick this up. It's free. Come pick it up. Why wouldn't you? Uh, next is Marvel Comics 1001, and these, you know, Marvel Comics, they're, this is celebrating, celebrating the 80th anniversary, and it continues, and it breaks down a lot like the, um, Marvel Comics 1000 issue, where each page is a separate story, and they all go over different stuff, and it runs the gamut between what-ifs, to comedy relief, to, like, shocking, almost horror story type stuff. And it's, honestly, it's a really good time. The thing I really like about the, this book and, and Marvel Comics 1000, pretty much the style of books, is that you get a lot of artists and a lot of writers in one book. And they're great. It's It was, honestly, one of the more fun showings. I, I can't read off all these names, but you just have a giant amount of of uh, artists and writers at work, creators at work in this stuff. So anyways, uh, Marvel Comics 1001, come pick this up. It's great. It's a really, really good showing. I had a good time with it. Next is Black Terror number one. Now, as we need to do, we have to tell you that any number ones that we cover are going to be spoiled a little bit because you can't talk about a, a new comic on our shelves without spoiling some of it. So this follows a character who used to be a, a vigilante, a hero, pretty much. Uh, he does have some, uh, well, he has a lot of superpowers that stem from him being a pharmacist and inhaling some special ether that, like, gave him, uh, gave him anti-aging abilities, gave him uh, indestruct indestructible stuff. And he's aged. He's, he's not aged well. His mind's starting to go. He's sort of trying to decide what to do with his life. And he comes to the conclusion that maybe he uh, is just addicted to crime fighting. Because he's been addicted to Valium. There's a lot of drug use in this book, fair warning. Um, but he's decided that maybe he's addicted to crime. And he's going, or fighting crime. And he's going to go with that. So Black Terror. Uh, the, the book itself is filled with a lot of humor. There were a lot of uncomfortable moments. There were a lot of just funny one-liners. A lot of stuff that was delivered well. I liked the writing quite a bit, um, but this is by Dynamite, and this is Bemis, uh, Gaudio, Pazilio, and Episto. Um, the one thing I do have to warn you is the thing that I didn't like all that much was the art. I'm not sure why. Um, the art feels good at times, and then we're generic. And more, and more importantly, like, something about the way this artist does facial expressions does not feel right. I'm not sure what it is. But uh, it's like they nail it sometimes, and then other times it, it looks, I, I don't know, otherworldly, I guess is the way you'd word it. Just doesn't seem to fit at times. So I, I'm not sure what the deal is, but maybe they'll hammer it out in the long run. It is a great comic. I had a good time with it, and that's issue one of Black Terror. Come pick this up if uh, you want a good number one to start with. Uh, next is Berserker Unbound, issue number three. Did not know that... Like, wow, was this a slow burn. Berserker is basically a Conan character. He's existed before, um, and he winds up going through other realities, like a portal, and winds up in our timeline. And he's hanging out with a bum, a guy who's lost his family, and pretty much he's down on his luck in life, and in, he just wants to get another bottle. And that's what they did for, like, two issues, and most of the third. And then something finally happened. Uh, Berserker's world with an evil sorcerer, starts to blend into this world and we're gonna see some some shots fired so i it was a really really good issue it's what i wanted to see uh they slow burned it it felt right it didn't like drag on too terribly long i'm having a great time with this book so berserker unbound the art is just i, I gush about it every single time I, yeah it's diodato it's so good and jeff lemire is writing it so no wonder i like this book it's just a great showing all around um, but anyways, so come pick this up. Issue number three. It's, it's awesome. 
next to Sea of Stars. And this, of course, is Jason Aaron, uh, Dennis Hallam, Stephen Gray, and Enrico Renzi. Now, if you don't know, uh, the wrap-up for this book is one part of it feels like survival story, where a father and a son have been separated, and the dad needs to survive in space and navigate different locations to, to, to get parts to replace, like, life support stuff, his ship. He's, he's fighting with his robot at the same time, and he's just basically trying to survive. Um, meanwhile, the son is like space superhero story where he's sort of flying around, he's discovering he has powers, and he's trying to figure out where to go from there. And that's, that's the wrap-up. It's a great story, um, it's, but it hasn't resolved hardly anything. And they're sort of getting to the bottom of, of some of the stuff in this issue, but not really. Um, that, 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 go figure, it's Jason Aaron, and he likes to tell stories that are sort of long, and they, they seem drawn out at first, and then there's a lot of depth. And that's usually what you end with with Jason Aaron, is like, whoa, wh how did we go from point A to point B so far when I didn't see it coming? And that's, that seems like that's what's happening here. Uh, again, another slow burn. It's, it seems to be the theme of the week. Um, but anyway, so this is a father, a son, and a whole lot of space between them. This is Sea of Stars, issue number four. It's a great showing. Come pick it up. All right, next book is Brisson, Ant Antonio, and Gandini, and this is Contagion. If you can't tell, this is Ben Grimm versus a, a well, a plague. <laughs> uh, pretty much somebody's going around uh, diseasing the denizens of Manhattan and uh, messing with Yancey Street. Yeah, whoa, yeah. Whoa. It gets, it nobody gets, messes with nobody Street. messes with Yancey Street. It gets mentioned on like the first page, Yancey Street, and then three times after, I count it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. So, uh, and, uh, well, some bad stuff happens. The Fantastic Four show up, and it, it looks like one of the last men standing might be Ben Grimm. Is this a good comic? It's a great comic. I had a really, really good time with it. Uh, the art felt good. It, it, it was honestly pretty good art. It was fun. Uh, it didn't feel generic. Um, the storyline is it's wild. I'm not quite sure how this guy got diseased. I think it was explained, but I'm not sure if I remember. Um, but he's infected everything. He's infected Mo Man and, you know, the, the bull people. There's, there's a bunch of stuff in this. It's, it's a good comic. I, I don't know kind of floundering here i i'm trying not to spoil the story but he's made of rocks. i don't know there's much to spoil yeah he's made of rocks so he can't get infected so he's just punching the crap out of him <laughs> yeah kind of what so you like it's about yeah it's what you like about ben Grimm. i had a good time with it it's just i i don't there's not a lot of story to this people are infected and ben Grimm's got to figure out without punching all of them how to solve the problem contagion <laughs> all right Punch it to, just keep punching the, just punch the disease out of them. <laughs> That's what you do. That's what you do on Yancey Street. Yeah, Yancey Street. He's like, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> All right, next is, man, oh man, I wanted this so bad. So, so bad. This is, of course, City of Bane, Batman number 80. And Batman, well, he's back in Gotham. More importantly, we find out on the first page why he had that nice Commissioner Gordon mustache. Because he's playing Commissioner Gordon? At one point he does, oh, and wow. it's awesome. <laughs> that's, that's the very beginning. I'm not going to spoil too much of this. I will say that what is happening is well calculated. I, I think it's... It's, it's honestly, it's, it's a sort of deeper meaning. It has forced Thomas Wayne to make a decision that he may not be able to make, which might put him at odds with Bane. And that's cool. That's, that's just good writing. Uh, go figure. I'm a giant King fan. But honestly, the fight to take back Gotham City of Bane, I can't, I can't say much about it without spoiling it. All you need to know is this is finally Batman is back in Gotham. He's fighting to take it back. And he's doing it with Catwoman, and it's awesome. So come pick this up. Please come pick it up. It's good. Um, and, yeah, there's also the uh, deceased variant cover art, too. Yeah. Next is Vengeance of Vampirella. And I, I should preface this that uh, I'm not the biggest Vampirella fan. Uh, I, I tend to think, like, I don't know, there's something about the art. The art always feels a bit generic to me. And at times it just feels like, I, I don't know, like they're just trying to appeal to the male audience. I, I can't, I mean, I, it just seems like they're just drawing 
half-naked women all the time. That's what a lot of Vampirella feels like, and you get that in this issue. Like, you're going to get a lot of sort of sex cells type stuff. Um, but I will say that as somebody who is not a Vampirella fan, I honestly had a pretty good time with this story. It takes place in the future. Uh, it involves um, pretty much Vampirella has lost the fight to another character named Nyx, who apparently is a, serves the gods of chaos. And she sort of put Vampirella down, and mankind is suffering because of it. They're almost extinct. So she's pretty much somebody's got to bring back Vampirella. That, that's that's the story. So it's 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 pretty good. It's not bad. Uh, it was more than I expected from a Vampirella story because usually it's just like, hey, we have to go fight. Let's go punch stuff. And then let's l stand there and pose like pretty, I guess, is how you describe I don't know. Uh, some of the poses they put these characters in, um, it's always weird for me. But anyways, if you're a Vampirella fan, I think you'll be totally happy with this issue. Um, if you like these sort of things, this might be your gem. The art to me, for whatever reason, always feels really generic and is just not my gem. Granted, I think the cover is kind of cool. Um, but so if, if you want this, it's a number one. Come pick it up. Um, next is Green Lantern. And this is issue 12. This is sort of wrapping up the Morrison Green Lantern. Sort of? Uh, we do know that something gets changed. We've, we've seen the preview. We've commented on it. So I'm going to comment on it. Uh, Black Stars might be taking the place of Green Lantern. And that might be coming about in this issue. And it could be totally affecting the DC Universe as a whole. So come pick this up. It was actually really cool. And as someone who has been a little critical of uh, Sharp's art in this book, which I have, I, I, it hasn't sung to me, it, it, it felt better in this issue, but it's still not my favorite by any means, and that's been my biggest problem with this run, but this story is really cool, like, what happened in this, I didn't expect, and I, go figure, Grant Morrison is like that, at first it's always confusing and weird and confusing and weird, and then something really cool and wicked happens, so that's, that's Grant Morrison in a nutshell. Um, but anyways, issue 12, Green Lantern, Beware My Power. The next issue is not a Green Lantern issue. Yeah. So anyways, come pick this up. Uh, what, what are they called? Did I call them Dark Stars? They're Black Stars. Black Stars. Okay, as long as I said that. Um, okay. Next is Harley Quinn, uh, and this is issue 66. So if you don't know, Harley's been going on this character arc where she's toward, trying to become the Angel of Retribution, I guess is what it is. So she had a bunch of tests, and she survived them all. And she's been endowed with the powers as the Angel of Retribution. But she blames these people for her mother's death from cancer. These, I guess, gods. The god of, just, or the god of order and the god of chaos. She blames them for her mother's death. So the second she gets the power, guess what she does? Tries to? Yeah, that's a very Harley thing to do. This, uh, honestly, it plays out exactly how you would expect with Harley. A long building story arc towards something where, in the end, she really didn't give a crap about it. And it was awesome. So if you love Harley, and you know who you are, if, if you love Harley and you like complex characters like Harley, you will have an absolute good time with this story. I honestly did. I, it's, at, at times, she's kind of predictable i hate to say it like i sort of saw it coming but you want that from her character you want that sort of chaos you you expect that whatever she's trying to achieve that she's gonna wind up burning it to the ground and and that's that's what i want so it was a good showing all right we have a giant amount of books so uh, i'm just gonna keep going to it and powering through future foundation honestly future foundation had a I, I, I wasn't a giant fan of the first issue. I thought it was okay. Um, I wasn't sure that I wanted to be invested in these characters. However, this issue has convinced me otherwise. My god, there was a lot of action, a lot of twists. It involves sort of a, another world. Um, you know, Franklin and Valeria are trying to, to get to the bottom of the way things are. There might even be a scroll in play of a character that most of us love. So I honestly, it was a really, really cool showing. I've been having a good time. There's a lot of intrigue and a lot of action in Future Foundation. The art is great. The writing is great. This is Whitley, Robson, Diaz, Menzi, and Farrell. So if you need a little more Fantastic Four, come pick it up. Oh, but that's the maker, right? On the cover, that is the maker. Yep. 
Uh, I I don't recall seeing him in this issue. So for whatever reason, he's on the cover, but I don't remember seeing him in this issue. So anyways, Com picked this up. It was a really, really good showing. I wonder if they're foreshadowing. I mean, comic covers predated clickbait. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but, okay, next is Star Wars Adventures. This is weird. Vader's castle wasn't a Star Wars Adventures thing, was it? It was a, it, and it was a very spooky sort of line. This is Star Wars Adventures: Return to Vader's Castle, the Horn Devil. Which, if you don't know who that is, that's Darth Maul, and that's when he, after he got cut in half, he like bound himself to a spider bot. Oh no, it was. It was in fact Star Wars Adventures. Oh, was it was Star Wars Adventures, the Vader's Castle thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. I didn't know that. Good job on that. Okay. Um, the art was amazing. The story was honestly, it was great. I had a good time with this. This was, uh, this was a very, very strong showing for a Star Wars book. And uh, although I'm, as Star Wars Adventures is typically a kids line, this was borderline, like not borderline. This was quite creepy um, uh, at times. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I'd be kind of on the fence. I would say like let somebody check it out first. But Darth Maul is like super spooky in this. Um, it, it was a great. A really, really cool story, and I guess it's perfect for Halloween is what it feels like. So come pick this up. This is a, oh, wow, five-week event, so we'll be getting this every week, I guess, uh, till November. So anyways, come pick this up. Return to Vader's Castle, great showing, guys. Uh, who, who did this? I, I can't, oh, it's uh, Fr Francovia and Levens and Kirchhoff. Anyways, so come pick this up, please. Next is Vampire State Building, and this says it's from the artist of The Walking Dead. Well, let me ask you something, Yogi. If a bunch of vampires took the Empire State Building hostage, sealed it up, started killing people, and then were throwing people off the roof as human sacrifice, why do you think they were doing it? Blood gods? Maybe! Maybe a blood god's in play! I don't know! Uh, but anyways, uh, it's, it's honestly, it's kind of a cool story. Like, it, there's a lot of panic. It has very much does have a Walking Dead feel. Like, all of a sudden, there are monsters. We've got to get away from them. Uh, too bad we're trapped in this building with them. What do we do? And, and, you know, things are getting sour. It's fun. I had a good time with it. I didn't know I wanted this. This is on Grinnell and Charlie Adler. Uh, and it says, from the artist of the Walking Dead Vampire State Building number one, come pick this up. It's a pretty good choice. Uh, granted, I mean... What I broke down is pretty much the plot, <laughs> so you don't expect anything deeper than that, but if you're a Walking Dead fan, you will have a good time with this book. I love this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> Next is Superman up in the sky, and this is King Kubert, Hope, and Anderson, and I don't think I've hidden that I've really, really loved this story uh, so far. I've loved it, but the best part about this issue, something that I'm truly happy to see is they finally settled the bet on who's faster, Superman or The Flash. That's covered in this issue. And I loved it. It was great. It was great. How they handled it was good. Um, yeah, that was awesome. And then it tackles um, something that happened in space, I think in the last issue, where uh, Superman and Clark Kent sort of got split into two people, and there's a reason for it. And... You know, um, they're just, they're not good separate. Um, they both are sort of finding out that they need each other. Um, anyway, so that's issue four, Superman up in the sky. Come pick this up. Uh, it's just fun. I, I don't know, I'm a King fan, so it's just fun to see, you know, more of him in other with other heroes is what I mean to say. So anyways, come pick this up. Next is Kanto, and oh, oh my god. I haven't read Kanto in a, a few issues. I sort of left it off, I think, at issue two, maybe? Um, and if you don't know who Kanto is, he's a very, very tiny knight who is in searching for his heart and, I guess, his village's heart, which they've all been replaced with, like, clockwork stuff. So he's fighting to get to win the hearts of his village back. Oh, isn't that sweet? Oh. But uh, old Kanto, even though he's, like, pint size, he's, like, Cabbage Patch doll size with, uh, you know, a little Cabbage Patch doll axe, he's a badass, and, and I love it. Uh, he faces down everything. There are times where he's like, I, I shouldn't be brave here, but I need to be brave, and he sort of faces up to it. There's so much heart into this story. I've loved it so much. And granted, I know Kanto's not a new character. He's been in other stuff, or he's, there's been other Kanto runs, but um, this was awesome. This is Boor, Zucker, Estonian, Bennett. 
issue number five of Kanto. I would say that if you don't know this story, you could probably still jump in here and have a good time. Uh, I really did, and I hadn't read it in a few issues. It was it was really, really something to see. So at the very least, come pick it up and thumb through it off our shelves and see if that's your jam. Next is, oh, man, I, I need a drink for this because I'm going to gush. Mm -mm -mm. This, ah, oh, man, we've been waiting. When we opened the store, when we opened the store, there were two image books that I fell in love with, and I think it was during either our first or second uh, book reviews. Uh, one of them was Blackbird. Jen Bartell did, and Sam Humphreys did not disappoint on that. I had such a good time with that, and I love the art. The other one was one called Dead Rabbit. Now, Dead Rabbit wound up, there was a bar called Dead Rabbit who had a cocktail book that they claimed was like a trade paperback graphic novel. And so they turned around and they sued Image Comics for $2 million. Jerks. Total jerks. I'm sorry. You, uh, like, that, that's just a jerk move. Um, they, they weren't trying to steal your business at the bar, man. Um, but so what happened was Image said, well, full stop. We're going to recall all the books. We're, we're not going to. We, 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 we got to deal with this lawsuit, we, and we just got to recall everything. So that's what they did. And Jerry D uh, Duggan, McCree, Spicer, and Sabino, it was shelved. And they, they were tight-lipped. We didn't know that they were going to do anything with it uh, for a long time. We thought it was just done. Uh, and I was sad because, like, the storyline was great. It was gripping. It had a character that was very Boston that would, like, throw on brass knuckles and punch through stuff if he had to. Uh, and he was sort of coming out of retirement to help his sick uh, wife. and to Because he didn't have the funds, and he needed to help his sick wife. And meanwhile, the mob thought he had stole millions on his last job, and that's why he retired. And he didn't steal millions. So somebody got up, pulled the fast one, and blamed him for it. And so he, he was just retired. And we thought that book was done. Like, we just hadn't heard hide in our hair. Uh, I think in 10 months. It was 10 months, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, they had shirts, man. They had shirts. shirts. Yeah, and I didn't get one. But I'm really happy to say that Dead Rabbit has been recocked. And although I don't like the name as much, uh, Dead Eyes is on our shelf. And it's issue number one. And I thought issue number one was amazing. And issue number two, I had a really good time with it. It, it was basically a job that falls apart in the funniest of ways. I love this character. I love the story. I loved everything about this book. Uh, I love the art. I love the character. It was, it was just enough comic and uh, plenty of action. That's the sort of thing I like. And that, that's what you got. It's pretty much the same book. So if you read Dead Rabbit and you don't want to spend money on Dead Eyes number one, I completely understand. But if you haven't jumped in, uh, come pick this up. If, if you're planning on picking up that story uh, and continuing on, issue three is the one that you need to pick up if you haven't got issue one and two. Um, and anyway, so issue number one, come pick this up. It was a great ride. I had a good time. And honestly, it was my first image book love in this store. So anyways, Dead Eyes number one is on our shelf. Next is Old Man Quill, and well, we found out a lot about Old Man Quill. First of all, we found out that most of the Guardians were dead, and that he was actually seeing them, and they weren't actually there. Uh, and, and then meanwhile, the, the, what, what's the Church of Eternal Truth, I think is what it's called, the Church of, I, I can never remember their name. But they've sort of spread across the U.S., and meanwhile, the Doombots have been activated, and they're fighting stuff. And, you know, Old Man Quill, I have a pretty good time with it, but... I don't know if I like his apocalypse. Like, his apocalypse is kind of a pain in the butt at times. Uh, and, and I get it. It's an apocalypse, but there should be a little more fun than, than that. Uh, granted, I'm, I'm still having a good time. This book does have a decent sense of humor. At one point, um, a bunch of Doombots are flying across the galaxy to Earth, and they fly by Titan, and it shows, like, like uh, Thanos is on the planet, like, like, farming, and he, like, looks up are on the moon and farming and he looks up and he sees all these doom bots go by and he's like oh the earth is screwed and just goes right back to farming <laughs> so That's awesome. i mean it's at least it has its sense of humor this is sax gill and rosenberg um i uh mm, mm, old man quill i'm it's issue 10 and i'm still sort of on the fence about it so if it's not your jam or you don't like guardians then you you probably skip it but if you do like guardians and you need another book come pick this up Next is, wow, okay, Immortal Hulk, Absolute Carnage. Now, I will preface this by saying this is Ewing. 
Andre and O'Halloran, and I think Andre is the guy that filled in while, uh, who was it that took a break on the Immortal Hulk book for a bit? I can't remember his name. It's, it's going to leave me. I'm, I'm sorry I failed. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, don't, I don't like his art. I have to say that. Um, it's, it's too pencil-y, not enough ink is sort of my take on it. And it's whatever. It's, it's, it's his style. I, it's just not my jam is what I'm trying to say. Now, was the story great? The story was awesome. It was so good. Um, basically, if you didn't know, in the last Absolute Carnage, the end of it, what happened was the Hulk got the Venom symbiote, and we've never seen that before. And I can't imagine a worse or more monstrous thing. And it showed very clearly that Cletus Cassidy was scared. Uh, so this picks up at that moment, that moment where Hulk is being infected with the symbiote and where he's deciding what to do. And there's all these characters. There's Bruce Banner having a talk in a dark room. Meanwhile, like, Joe Fixit passes through. The Brown Hulk pops up and says, you know, something a little more deep than normal. Uh, and then, like, regular old Hulk, not, not Devil Hulk, but old Hulk comes through and says, you know, he gives his two cents in his purple shorts. So there are all these voices inside of uh, Banner's head. And meanwhile, it pulls back to Immortal Hulk. It pulls back to that moment where they were in the hotel room where Betty was, like, in the bathroom with, uh, uh, who was it she was in there with? The Absorbing Man, I think it was? But anyways, so it goes back to that moment and it shows, like, how that stuff sort of tied in to what was going on with Absolute Crunch, which was cool to see. That means Ewing's been plotting this for a while, because that's, I think that's like six or seven issues back uh, in, a, in a Mortal Hulk. So, pretty deep, pretty good, man. Uh, so, the story was great, but basically all these voices in Banner's head are coming to, to the conclusion that they might need the Venom symbiote for this, but they're not sure they want it because there's plenty of voices in there already. So, yeah, it was awesome. It was really, really good showing. Uh, Ewing, Andre, O'Halloran had an absolutely amazing time with this book. Come pick it up. And, and granted, I had that good of a time as somebody who doesn't like the... Uh, doesn't, I, I shouldn't say I don't like it. The, the guy is an amazing artist. He's just not my cup of tea. So that's all I'm going to say. Uh, issue number one, come pick that up. Next is another really, really good issue number one, and that is Ghost Rider number one. This is Brisson, Cooter, and Keith. Uh, again, I don't know, the art, I was kind of on the fence about it at times, but then by the end of it, really, really loved. Uh, I Go figure. Once they start getting all the chains and flames in play, I, I really dig it. Um, but this is Ghost Rider number one. This basically... Well, Johnny Blaze has issues. He's, he's the king of hell currently. He doesn't want to give up the crown. But the crown might be changing him. And on top of that, he's sort of dealing with insurrections. Like, people who serve Mephisto that do not want to give in to King Blaze, as it would. So, Johnny's sort of plugging up holes, trying to prevent uh, people from escaping. And then, at the same time, trying to get to the bottom of, like, who has escaped and who needs to be handled. So, he goes up to Earth. And wouldn't you know it, he meets old Danny Ketch, who is uh, currently an alcoholic. So, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, and, and Danny Ketch might be being tricked by Mephisto into thinking that, that maybe Johnny Blaze is a little more sinister than he is. So we're going to get a lot of fights between Ghost Riders, it feels like, and that's what I want. I, I want that mashup again. I, I want to see him tangle. Uh, more importantly, I love the way the artist, like, I, I think I told you I didn't like the art at the beginning, but by the end of it, it really sold. Uh, about halfway through, you started getting, like, you know, Johnny Blaze's feel and Danny Ketch's feel. And I, I think Danny Ketch, like, I remember growing up with Danny Ketch. So the, the way his flames look, they're really intricate. The way his bike looks with the, the thing mounted on the front that sort of looks like a wicked sort of skull, like black skull and stuff like that. I always sort of liked that. And even though I'm not really a big sports bike fan. Uh, so anyways, issue number one, Ghost Rider. Had an amazing time with it. Come pick this up, please. Next book is Deceased number five. So if you haven't been following Deceased, uh... Batman's down, he's dead, um, and uh, Damian Wayne has taken up the mantle, so it's, there's a very tiny Batman, and I kind of love it. Uh, more importantly, uh, there, there's just so much death and sacrifice in this story. Uh, however, I don't know, I can't think of worse people to get infected than the Justice League, and some of them do in this. Uh, I mean, we already lost Batman, so all, all you know is that there's going to be a lot of tragedy, but it's kind of cool to see. The way the world is sort of dividing and people are coming to conclusions as to how to 
like just protect the last remnants of humanity in the DC storyline um, and how to take down the internet because that's how one of the ways the virus spreads. It's really, really cool and fun to see. Like I'm having a good time with this. Um, granted, I don't think if you haven't been on board with DCs, jumping in on five is probably not the issue to do it. But I will say it wasn't terribly confusing. You just need to know that, well, some people have died. Uh, and that's the way it goes. Um, we will see probably the worst person to get infected get infected. And if you know anything about the DC Universe, it pretty much centers around him. So you know who I'm talking about. And that's kind of frightening. Um, so DC's number five, a really, really good read. However, I really think you have to be on board with DC's to... to to jump into this issue you can uh it's perfectly serviceable i don't think you'll be confused i just don't think you'll be as into the story or know all the cogs and everything come pick up some back issues i don't do we have back issues of deceased no. i don't think we do it sells out um yeah i don't know you'd probably have to hunt elsewhere for those um next is wow i was shocked at how much i like this uh this is bizarre adventures number one um, it says four tall tales that could only be called bizarre. Now, if you can't tell from that cover, that's Dracula and, and uh, what's the wolf guy's name? I always forget his name. Yeah, Moon Knight appeared. Uh, it, yeah, Moon Knight's first appearance is, is like in, a, I think, a tale, Bizarre Tales comic. It might not be Bizarre Tales, but it's centered around like the, the wolf guy. Um, so, yeah. Um, is Moon Knight in this issue? No. Um, but, but what you do get is you get a 70s throwback to old 70s tales. Uh, the way Marvel sort of did these, uh, these uh, split-up story books back in the day. And it's great. I had a really, really good time. We get Bloodstone, who is pretty much the guy... Before, uh, the, was he the father or the grandfather of Elsa Bloodstone? I think he was the grandfather of Elsa Bloodstone. But... So he's in there. You get a story from Chang Sheng Chi that made me audibly laugh out loud. Like I, I, I couldn't believe all his fight moves. One of them included uh, 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 another character when he's drunk is what it was described as. It was hysterical. Um, you get a Dracula story, which is kind of a love story. I had such a good time with uh, all these stories. So Bizarre Adventures, number one. Come pick this up. It's, it's fun, but more importantly, it just... It feels like a piece of Marvel history that I didn't get enough of because I was way too young back then. So anyways, come pick this up. Next is Space Bandits. And we do have one issue that is 75 cents. It's the C cover. I have no idea why it's 75 cents. It's the same issue. But it, it's just Mark Millar being nice. So we'll put it on our shelf. And if you come pick up that issue, you're going to save some bucks. So this is Mark Millar, uh, Mateo Scalera. And this is Space Bandits. This story is awesome. Uh, I'm not sure you need to know more than the fact that these two, two gals have been betrayed. They're sort of on a quest of vengeance to like get people back. It involves several people. And uh, one of them was betrayed by her ex-boyfriend. The other one was betrayed by her, uh, basically her crew. And so that's all you need to know. More importantly, it's, it's in space. And the future space, space theme, I guess you could say space theme, is the 80s. So there was, like, Starship Lionel Richie, and there, there's so many, like, it just feels like Space 80s. It's fun. It's sort of campy at times, but it's not silly campy. Uh, I had a good time with it. There is weird traditions in it that don't quite make sense, but, you know, make sense for aliens, I guess you could say. Uh, I, I've not been bored with this story at all. And the art, the art is amazing. I've really loved this art. Uh, I, now I'm not sure what is it, what it is about it. Uh, all the pinks and blues, probably. Just it's so 80s fun. So anyway, Space Bandits issue number four. It is not too late to get out on this. I would say you could jump in on this one and not be confused. Maybe have a good time. Maybe enjoy the next couple books. So come pick this up. Next is an awesome, awesome book. Mm. Sorry, my throat's starting to go. This is No One Left to Fight. Now. If you are a Dragon Ball Z fan and you wonder what happens when Goku beats everyone in the whole universe and has no one left to fight, that's this story. And it's fun. There's politics. There's sort of, you know, um, the bonds between characters. They cross boundaries that normal Dragon Ball Z can't. And more importantly, you can totally see what characters are what characters in the story. Like the Hermit, uh, they go to his planet and the, the character itself is called a Hermit and it looks pretty similar to him uh the master roshi looks like master roshi um everything about it you can tell who the vegeta character and the goku character is so if you are a dragon ball z fan 
and you just want a little something different, but sort of the same themes, this is perfect for you. Come pick it up. Uh, and this is, it says it's the comic you always wanted. And they're not wrong. I did kind of want that comic. Uh, issue number four, Dragon Ball Z with a little bit more adult themes is what it feels like. Uh, come pick this up. Next is the Dark Arc. And this is Cullen Bunn and Juan Doe and David Sharp. Dave Sharp. While I really wanted to like this story because it's Cullen Bunn, I was a bit confused. The, the plot was a little confusing. It, it centers around Noah's Ark and what happens to Noah's Ark after it. Apparently Noah's Ark uh, has some type of magic power and there are people in this world that are sorcerers. And I'm, I'm not sure where they were going with all this. It was a little, little wild and it, at times it felt like three separate stories and a bit disjointed. But it's Cullen Bunn, so he'll tie it all together eventually. Uh, he's definitely a good writer. The art was, yeah, the art was pretty good. I, I had a good time with the art. I'm just not sure what the direction was. So anyways, if you need a number one and you want a little bit of magic, sorcery, and I don't know, uh, biblical artifacts, uh, <laughs> this is the book for you. And that's Dark Ark After the Flood, issue number one by Aftershock. Come pick this up. Next is, my God, I've had a good time with this book. That is Black Cat, and she's, she's ripped off Sanctum Sanctorum. Uh, what else has she ripped off? Do you remember? No, I just remember the Sanctum Sanctorum. I, yeah, that's the one where I was like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> um, yeah, so she's done that. There, there was somebody else she ripped off at the beginning. I can't remember. Uh, and now she's trying to rip off the Fantastic Four. The problem with that is when you try to charm your way and charm Johnny Storm and get into the Fantastic Four headquarters on Yancey Street, yeah. uh, there's a problem. There is a lot of chaos that follows the Fantastic Four. And so that sort of happens in a portal opening in, their man or in the Fantastic Four uh, headquarters. And so she's got to deal with that. Meanwhile, her guys are amazing. Like, Black Cat is an awesome character, but I've really come to love, like, her team. Because she's got, she's got like, one guy who's just kind of ridiculously smart and can rewire anything. And then she's got another guy who's, he's pretty much the Ben Grimm of her team is what he feels like. Like, he's, he's fully human, but he just doesn't quit. And I, I sort of like that character. He's very flawed. He gets beat up a lot, but it's fun. Uh, so this is Black Cat, issue number five. This is McKay, Foreman, and Reber. Totally great book. And if you aren't on board with Black Cat, come pick this up. This is a great book to jump in on. Granted, it's sort of mid-stuff, but I broke down what happened. That's all you need to know. Uh, next is Legion of Superheroes Millennium. This is the build-up to Legion of Superheroes. And that build-up centers around Rose and Thorn. Now, if you don't know who Rose and Thorn is... It's a character that was in Action Comics, and I'm not sure if she goes back before then. I don't remember Rose and Thorn before that. Do you? But I could be mistaken. Um, anyway, so she's a character that is very Jekyll and Hyde. She has a, a dark side. That dark side is called Thorn, uh, and Rose herself is, is... She's smart. She's just not really super strong, um, but Thorn is super strong. And then on top of that, they're sort of, well, immortal. They live forever. And the last issue showed Thorne, like, going through, like, hundreds of years and just feeling like she was suffering and, like, you know, she just wanted to, to die and she was going a little stir-crazy because she just lived for so long. And that's the build-up. She's, she's the one character who lived in the 20th century and is going to wind up in the 30th century. And in this issue, I'm happy to say they did it on the low-key and you didn't quite see him suit up, but... She encounters Booster Gold, and she might have actually inspired Booster Gold to go be the 20th century hero that he is. Or I guess, in this case, 21st now, but um, yeah. So that was really cool to see. They're doing some cool stuff on the sly in this book. Granted, I think the last book was, while it was interesting, but I liked the Rose and Thorn character, I could see how if somebody didn't like that character, they, they wouldn't want to read that issue. This one, on the other hand, felt great. The art was all over the place, and that's good showing. Uh, it was like three separate tales, but centering around the same character because she's sort of moving through time. Uh, and the art was just, it was very diverse. The writing was great. They're building up towards the Legion of Superheroes, and it's awesome. So come, p come pick this up. Issue number two is great. Next is Dr. Aphra. Uh, 
I haven't hidden that Star Wars Dr. Aphra has been my favorite Star Wars title, and for good reason. The writing's great. The last issue showed uh, Darth Vader showing up and telling her, telling her uh, Dr. Aphra, the Empire needs your aid, and sort of enlisting her, her, uh, her aid. Well, Aphra is a character that she doesn't like. She likes being in control. She will go between the Empire and the Rebellion uh, from time to time, but... She likes that to be her choice. She does not like people telling her what to do. And that shows. She gets tased, I think, seven or eight times in this book. Because she doesn't want to get in line with the Empire. And it's fun every time. Like, I, I laugh the whole way through. She's, she's, she will say the line even though it gets her hurt. And then get right back up and go right back to being Dr. Aphra. I loved it. So anyways, uh, issue number 37, Star Wars Dr. Aphra. Come pick this up. It's a really, really good showing. Um, this is, of course, Spurrier, uh, oh man, I'll never pronounce this name, W-I-J-N-G-A-A-R-D, Wingard, maybe, and Low Ridge. Come pick this up, it's honestly the best Star Wars comic on our shelf. Uh, next is Justice League, issue number 30, 33, and this is the Doom Justice War. It is happening, they finally built it to the point where the multiverse is in the balance, and if Doom wins, if Doom is controlling everything, Perpetua, the goddess Perpetua, will get to reform the whole universe in her Apex Lex sort of image. And if she loses, the universe lives. If Justice wins, then the universe lives. And so that's what's going on. The Justice League has been split up. They're in three different timelines searching for a piece of uh, the continuity. Is, is, that, is that what it's called? A piece of totality. That's what I meant to say, the totality. Um... So we've got, I think, Flash and Aquaman. Aquaman showed back up, and he's in the past. And so, yeah, Flash is sort of dealing with that stuff uh, in the past. And then we've got Superman, the, basically the Trinity in the future. And then we've got the main timeline where they're out in space, and they're fighting uh, Doom. They're fighting Lex and Perpetua at the same time. And it's awesome. They've got Anti-Monitor. They've got Monitor. And uh, who's the other guy? World Forger? And they've, they form... The Ultra Monitor, which is really, really cool to see. you got to come see it. I, I, I don't want to show you more than that. Uh, <coughs> I'm having a great time with the story, but go figure. It's Snyder. Snyder knows how to tell a story. This is Snyder, Rigondo, Sampir, High Five. Uh, this is, it's getting near the climax of that story, and I feel like something big is really building, and this is like the issue before it. Uh, more importantly, Hot Girl in this issue belts out like Lex says way too much and goes too far and that felt so good I got so good watching her just fight and just get riled up and, and Hawk Girl honestly I'm not a big Hawkman fan but when I see Hawk Hawk, Hawk Girl get pissed off like oh it's so good so anyways uh in Justice League issue number 33 come pick this up next is Transformers Ghostbusters Issue number five, this is the wrap-up. This is the end. I didn't know it was ending after five. I thought it was going to six. Um, a great showing. It basically centered around Cybertron getting wiped out and most of the Decepticons being killed when Gozo the Gozerian, Gozo the Destructor, showed up and gave them the choice, exactly like the, what happened to the Ghostbusters in Ghostbusters 1. And <clears throat> so then the Decepticon ghosts show up on Earth. Prime shows up. Prime gets a, pay, a paint job. No, Ectotron shows up first. Ectrotron shows up first and takes the form of the Ecto-1, and then Prime shows up, and, uh, well, <clears throat> I'm happy to tell you, it might continue on. Ooh. Maybe. They hinted that there might be more. So, anyways, uh, Transformers Ghostbusters issue number five. The writers knew the franchises really well, and they did them justice, and it felt great the whole way through. So come pick this up. Uh, this is Burnham showing in Delgado. Uh, more importantly, the ghosts, at one point, it's like Starscream, uh, Starscream, Shockwave, and Soundwave all standing around, and they're like, yo, should we help? Should we intervene? Nah, I kind of like watching fighting. They're like, <laughs> yeah, okay. It just it felt right. So, yeah, anyways, uh, go pick this up. It's so good. Uh, next is Young Justice, issue number nine. This is Bendis, Araho, uh, Tims, and El, El Teb. I probably mispronounced this. This is Young Justice has found its way into, uh, well, uh, World 3. And if you don't know, Earth 3 is, um, it's the crime syndicate's Earth. It's where everything is sort of evil versions of 
the main characters. And that, that's what happens. And it turns out they find their own team. They, they find the opposite of them. And they have to deal with that and sort of contend with it. This issue centers around the character who was calling herself Teen Lantern, which I think is a terrible name. Don't you? It's a terrible name. We, we hate it. Yeah, we hate it. But she encounters the alternate version of herself who calls herself Hack. Because she's got, you know, a hacked... It's, it's the hacked gauntlet. And I think I have a sneaky suspicion that the gauntlet is something that Chroma had. The, the, it was the first... He was basically... He had a power gauntlet. And he was essentially sort of the first lantern. But he was a tyrant. Uh, yeah, I pointed that out on the first issue. I was like, she's got... I think she's got Chroma's gauntlet. Um, and it looks like it. it. It definitely has the power pack. It has the gauntlet. It feels like it is. But it's... I don't know, the power pack is square. It doesn't feel like it's the exact same thing. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. But it explains how she gets that gauntlet. Uh, it explains, it goes into her backstory. It goes into uh, her encountering her other character and sort of deciding at times where it feels like that name feels better. So I'm hoping they run with it. But we'll have to wait and see. It's a great issue. More importantly, like, Jenny Hex's counterpart is a jerk. And I loved it. Like, wow, she's an absolute jerk. So issue nine, uh, Young Justice, come pick this up. It's great. Hey, next book is Champions number 10. This is Zub, Cummings, and Menz. Menyes. Uh, Menyes. Sorry, uh, this is Champions and To the Future. And it shows the whole team. But the whole team was pretty divided. They had Blackheart in play. And Blackheart had taken control of some of them. And uh, forced the team to fight the team per se and it was it this is the wrap-up and it was a, honestly a really really fun wrap-up there's a lot of action i like the art uh the writing was fun the writing felt good uh it, it mostly centered around viv which i do like i really like viv um but the end it sort of says thank you for reading and the champions will return in incoming this december uh I, so are they killing the champions title they're coming as incoming is what it says I don't know. They just relaunched it. It's only 10 deep. It feels a shame that they would do that. But they wrap up a lot of the storyline. A lot of it has been going on with the Mephisto stuff. They sort of wrap it up. So I guess it kind of makes sense. But I, I, I just make it the end of an arc and keep going. I don't know why they keep doing that to this. This poor team, man. They just keep relaunching it. But it, it's a perfectly serviceable story. I had a really good time with it. Come pick it up. Oh, man. <clears throat> We gotta pour out, pour one out for my homie that is the Punisher and Rosenberg's run because this is the last book of Rosenberg's run, which I have had a complete blast with. I have loved it the whole way through. I love the way the man writes action. I love the art. I had so much fun. This is Rosenberg, Kurdansky, Fabella. This takes place in New York City uh, after Hydra. Well, not so much. Well, it is Hydra, but Hydra and uh, Baron Zemo have sort of taken refuge. Re refuge yeah in uh <laughs> in new york city and uh they're sort of trying to go to kingpin for help and and trying to defend against the punisher meanwhile the punisher is dealing with well his former team the thunderbolts a a sort of fake version of the thunderbolts and he's had to fight them off too and it, it was honestly a really really fun showing we got to see punisher uh, on a team that included moon knight which i didn't know was was the matchup i absolutely needed in my life and it was great um in fact, every Moon Knight line in this is amazing. I really feel like Rosenberg should be writing Moon Knight next. Um, oh, God, it was so good. Uh, the wrap-up was, well, I... Um, I don't know. I can't spoil it for you, but I was a little disappointed at the end. And I think Frank was, too, because he makes Nick Fury flinch, which is awesome. That's kind of what we wanted since, since Punisher War Machine. It was like, oh, Nick Fury... You already set this in motion. This is all your fault. And you're going to take it out on Frank? No, I don't think so. Like, and that's really what I wanted. So he made Nick Fury flinch. And for that reason alone, you should come pick this up. Plus, the cover is amazing. Look at that cover. It's just an awesome cover. So issue number 16, The Punisher. It's the final issue of Rosenberg's run, Sad Face. But come pick this up. Next is, well, I don't know. If Lisa Frank... In the 80s, the sticker maker designed a comic. You would have Star Pig's cover. <laughs> and this centers around a girl and, uh, well, her giant tardigrade. Her giant pink tardigrade. I'm not making that up. That's really what that creature is. And uh, she's sort of out in space and, well, dealing with space. And, I don't know, this felt a little aimless at times. It was weird. I, I don't know. 
I will call it a science fiction slice of life, is what it felt like. It didn't really feel like it went too far, but it was like a little interesting. And I'm not sure it scratched any itches, because I, I don't think I had an itch for that sort of thing. But the cover is amazing. I, I do have to tell you that. The art was really good. I, I, didn't, I didn't dislike the art. And I didn't hate the story. I'm just not sure where they're going with it just yet. It's not confusing. It's just sort of there. So anyways, if you like a little romance in your sci-fi, this is a perfectly serviceable book for you. Issue number three, Star Pig. Come pick it up. Next is, wow, you need to get this. This is $4.99. $4.99. Look how thick it is. This is a trade paperback size book. It's the Flash 100-page giant. And my God, it was amazing. It's awesome. <coughs> you get a bunch of stories, some that center around Flash, uh, one that centers around uh, Green Arrow and Black Canary, so the brave and the bold, uh, and then one that centers around um, Blue Beetle. And the Blue Beetle one was amazing, and more importantly, I think this Blue Beetle story at the end of this is telling us that we're going to get more Blue Beetle on the shelf. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, that's your favorite. Uh, it's yeah, one of my favorite characters, so I'm pretty hyped about it. Uh, anyway, so yeah. The Flash, uh, the 100-page giant. This is $4.99. It's, it's just a giant trade paperback of a book. You would be crazy to skip this if you're a DC fan, so come pick that up. Next is Doctor Strange, issue number 20. And in the last issue, we saw him take a deal. from a, It was like a guy surrounded by cursed spell books. And he was like, oh, you need this spell book of 50-50 odds. And he basically needed to use his hands to operate on a girl who had been in a car accident to save her life. For her mom and so he needed to fix his hands really fast so he took the deal and it turned out like it ripped his hands apart and then reformed him and now dr strange has healed his hands and we i don't think we've ever seen that i don't remember ever seeing that so he's got working hands the problem is well he he might have to relearn how to use them at times because he's not used to having perfectly functioning hands with spell work so uh that comes into play and on top of that he winds up back hanging out with the uh what is it, the Technomancer, I think, is, is her powers. So she's like the magic uh, sort of science-y character. So he winds up hanging out with her in space and dealing with the issues of a planet and uh, some other demon and, and technomancy magic thing. And it was a really, really fun ride. Mark Wade, Javier Pena, and, and Brian Reber. I don't think I've hidden that I've loved this Doctor Strange story, or uh, this Doctor Strange run. It's amazing. I've had such a good time with it. And each book feels better than the last. And so issue number 20, come pick it up. Next is Birthright, and Birthright is a story that centers around, well, one fantasy world that is looking to invade other realities, and the Earth that has sort of staved that off after they've made a deal. And now uh, the person who has sort of caused the magic, like made the magic happen for that to happen, uh, she's trying to destroy both realms and build her own realm. And so that's pretty wild to see. The characters are coming to grips with that and sort of trying to decide how to deal with that and what they need to do. And it's cool. I had a pretty good time with it. It's issue number 40. But I will say this. If you aren't involved in this story, this might be a little bit confusing to jump in on. I'd say maybe wait an issue or go back a couple issues and pick it up and, and go from there. Man, my voice is starting to go. This is Williamson, Bresson, Lucas. It's a great story. The art is amazing. I had a really good time with the art. Um, and I, I don't know. I liked everything about it. I just... It seems like it's the peak of something, so maybe you want to wait for a different book. Um, next is Spider-Verse, issue number one. God, that's weird to say. Spider-Verse, issue number one. When Spider-Verse was what, 2012? Back there. Yep. So they're dusting off the brand, and they're bringing it back. And we know that Madam Web was killed in Spider-Geddon. Um, so there hasn't been a web of life. Uh, well, the Web of Life is back, and more importantly, there is a new Madam Web who is called Spider Zero, and is a really cool character that I didn't know I wanted. She's got like a giant spider that hangs out on her shoulder and stuff like that, and uh, she seems pretty fun. And so she she decides that she's gonna pull Miles because she needs help because the Web of Life is infected. And old Mayday Parker, who is uh, who is actually um, I don't think it was Mayday. I think it was just plain old Mayday. It might have been Mayday. Yeah, that was me. Okay, maybe it was made. I'm, maybe I'm confused. There's so many Parkers and so many alternate versions of them, I get confused at times. But um, she was uh, pretty much the one uh, making the web, and she's disappeared. So they need to find it, and the web of life is sick. And it's really kind of cool to see because Spider-Zero pulls, uh, 
pulls Miles to her timeline and basically says, he's like, why didn't you call Peter Parker? And she's like, well, I sort of felt like this is something the new kids should handle. And I like that. I, I like that that whole premise. That felt right. More importantly, you get a little bit of spider punk in this story, and that's that's really what I want anyway. So anyways, this is Jed McKay, uh, Juan, Juan Frigeri, Arthur Adams, James Heron, Stacey Lee, and more. My God, there's a lot of people working on it. And it shows. It's a great book. I had a really good time with this book. Come pick it up. If you like the Spider-Verse, Multiverse uh, storyline stuff, uh, you will have an excellent time with this. Plus, I think there's first appearances in this, so come pick it up. Next is Nomen Omen, and my God, what a confusing book. Uh, so uh, it starts out with uh, well, a couple gals who are hanging out, and they find a terrible wreck. <clears throat> Somebody is dying uh, or is about to die. She may or may not have impregnated somebody, like, through, like, magic, it felt like. And then it cuts to another one of the characters being killed and because there was some sort of demon creature that could smell death, I guess. It's a weird wow. story. It's super weird. I have a feeling they're going to pull it together. I really think they are, but um, <clears throat> this is Marco, Marco B. Buki and uh, Bucci. Probably not Buki. <laughs> Marco B. Bucci. Uh, and and Jacopo Camagni, I've murdered these names. This is Nomen Omen, issue number one. It was confusing. I wish I could say something more, but uh, it didn't give me enough time to identify with the characters, and it was a little confusing. The art was great, I will say that, although I will say this is not a book for kids because there is a couple of pretty graphic sex scenes in the middle of it, so don't, don't sell this to kids. Or give this to kids, I guess. Yeah. We're not going to sell it to kids. You don't give it to kids. Yeah, there you go. Um, next is Savage Avengers, issue number six. This is Jerry Duggan, uh, Jacinto, and Bonvillain. Bon, bon 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 I never know how to pronounce his name. Um, but this is, uh, well, this is essentially what happens when Conan and Punisher go on a road trip, sort of. Uh, they're basically trying to take um, Frank Castle's... Uh, his family members who have been dug up, they're trying to take them back to uh, the United States. And meanwhile, they've got to travel through all the dark parts of the Savage Lands, so they've got to adapt. Eventually, the Punisher runs out of ammo, and he's got to adapt, and it was really, really fun to see. But, I mean, I will say that the best bromance out of the Savage Avengers team is most definitely Wolverine and Conan, but uh, what I didn't know I wanted was Conan and Punisher as, as, you know, a little buddy team. And they don't have the same charisma as that, they, that other team did, or the other matchup did. But it, it still felt pretty good. It's a fun read. I, I've loved everything about this Savage Avengers run. I've had such a good time with it. The art is good. The writing is good. It's just fun. So come pick this up. <clears throat> Next is Mountainhead. And, well, I read the first issue, which centered around an Axeman... Uh, who's trying to handle stuff with the mountain, and it's sort of a cursed mountain. And uh, this picks up afterwards. The mountain has an eye at the center of it, and the eye is sort of spying on the townspeople. And some of the townspeople are infected, and it's not quite clear what they're doing, but they all sort of keep repeating this, this kid's voice and, like, killing people at the same time. So, yeah, that's the story. It's a little confusing, but I feel like it's, that's intentional. It's sort of a slow burn. This is John, John Lee's uh, Ryan Lee. Doug, Doug Barak, Bar sorry, I read that all wrong because of dyslexia. Doug Garbark and Sean Lee. It's a pretty good read, but it's a little confusing. Um, I would say go pick up issue number one first, but even then, I think you'll still be a little confused. I am. Um, it, it's not a terrible thing. I think it's going to be explained in another issue. It doesn't feel like it's like, I'm like, what is happening with the story? It feels like they're building towards something. Uh, the art is great. Come pick this up. Next is Grendel, Devil's Odyssey. I don't know if this character has existed before this. I don't remember this character, but it sort of looks vaguely familiar. And I think the reason why is it looks like it is what happens if you make a space version of Spawn and the Punisher and smoosh it together. And that's what this character is. Uh, meanwhile, it's sort of dealing with the fact that mankind is, is warring with itself, it's killing itself, and Grendel gets sent on one final mission to find a new world for uh, mankind to populate. And sort of, he sets out with an AI. And <clears throat> I will have to tell you this. That is a lightsaber. If I've ever seen one, that is a lightsaber and a lightsaber shield. A laser and sword. It, okay, laser sword. That's a lightsaber. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm actually on board with this. 
I, I don't know anything about this character, but I was intrigued. It was kind of fun. Um, I, I didn't hate it. That's Grendel Devil's Odyssey, issue number one of eight. Uh, this is Matt Wagner and, and Brendan Wagner. Oh, a family team. Uh, and this is Dark Horse Comics. Come pick this up. It was honestly a pretty good show. Lastly is House of X, issue number six. So this is the wrap-up. This is everything that's been building. We've been dealing with a different Professor X, and it shows. It shows intensely because he flat out, at one point in this book, tells all of mankind that, look, normally these creations, these mutant pills that we've made to make your life easier, and these ways we've provided to make your life easier, I would have given them to you. Any other timeline, I would have gifted this to you, and I would have said it's to build a better rapport between us. But you people take. You always take. So instead of that, what I'm going to tell you is this. Like, we're giving this to you if you honor us as a nation, and if you let mutant law handle mutants, and if you don't interfere. And, and he's very brutal to the point, and at times it's very scary. It's creepy. I don't know where we're going with these mutants, but... Part of me feels like I wish I was a mutant when I read this because like the politics that they've put together, they, they start hashing out politics at one point and it looks like they're going to fight and then they all sort of come together and I loved how they handled it. It felt right. It was fun, intriguing almost. Well, not almost, totally intriguing. <laughs> uh, uh, it felt like, I, I don't know, like a, a meeting of like houses in Game of Thrones and it really is because there's the House of M and the House of X and... The island is being split up in different ways. They've hashed out, they're starting to hash out how they're going to handle uh, what they're going to do, like law-wise, everything. So this is setting the stage for all of the Hickman X-Men stuff that's coming. You really need this book, honestly. I would say if you haven't been on board with all the House of X stuff, um, come pick this up anyways. It was really, really intriguing. More importantly, they have a way to shelve mutants. In the island, a way to shelve mutants until they need them later. And it's really, really cool. It's wild to see. But uh, honestly, had the best time with this run. Everything about this was amazing. As someone who wasn't into mutants before this run, uh, uh, well, I kind of got into them with Rosenberg's uh, run. I did start to like them then. Uh, I really loved them with this Hickman stuff. So come pick up this issue. We have plenty of copies, and it's awesome. Uh, and that's our show for this week. Thank God, because my voice is about to crap out on me. Uh, squeakers on me. Mm, my throat is hurting. We're going to do our drawing right now and see who wins posters. First number is 342. That is going to be Lorenzo Silva. Lorenzo Silva, you've won a poster. Next number is 215. Let's see. Sean Pinzon. He just won a poster. Yeah, well, okay, I'm Sean Pinzol, you won a poster. That's why pays to pick up. <laughs> I'm spin. He didn't pick up this week. Yeah. So. Last one is 267. 267. All right. Kevin Hong. Kevin Hong, you won a poster. And that's our show for this week. Um, come pick up some books. We have a lot more trade. Uh, please come check us out this week. We've, we've got some stuff to sell. Oh, October. October so. Star Wars Month. We're oh, October is Star Wars Reads Month, and we're doing something on what day? Uh, I thought we were doing it all month. Oh, all month, but we're going to have the... Oh, yeah, we're supposed to have the 501st. We're going to have the 501st in here, but we're not quite sure yeah, the details just yet. Maybe but maybe. Star Wars Reads Month, so come pick up Star Wars comics and Star Wars stories and uh, celebrate Star Wars Reads Month. Kids yeah. comics, too. Kids yeah. comics, too. And we'll do the dance. Yeah.